This is Michael McQuistian, composer for Young Justice, and you're listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, zero, one. Recognized, Hector is funny, D, four, seven. Hello team, today in the Watchtower we welcome Hector Navarro. Hector is best known among our listeners as the co-host of DC Daily. Hector is also the co-host of Hyper Heroes and the 500 Greatest Films podcasts. Hector, welcome to Whelmed. Rich, it is an honor. Thank you so much, man. I'm so excited. <laughs> This is so great. I think the honor's ours. No, no, no. It's it's definitely mine. Uh, I'm a big <laughs> fan of the podcast and everything that you guys have been doing. And uh, it was really cool that you had asked me to uh, to come on and, and talk about Young Justice, which is great. Oh, well, we appreciate that. Uh, before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including up to episode 13 of season three, the comics and the video game. If you've not seen, read, or played all the material and are spoiler wary, Please consider this your warning. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. So, uh, I mean, I touched on the things that I think you're most well known for uh, in the intro, but tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do in the world. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I am a kid who grew up, born and raised in San Diego, California, which is the woot, woot. I woot, woot, that's right. <laughs> which is, I think, geographically, uh, at least continentally, like the furthest you could get in a city from New York City. Yes. Which, which to my childhood brain, as soon as I discovered comic books, as soon as I discovered Marvel comics and DC comics, and even though DC has characters and worlds that are fictional American cities like Gotham and Metropolis, the home of DC comics itself was for decades for most of its history, still New York city. The cities of Metropolis and Gotham are still based on New York. And so I, I had this, um, this connection to these worlds and, and, uh, again, growing up in San Diego, just thought it was the, the coolest thing that a uniquely American invention that superheroes and comic books and superhero comic books could, could provide this much, um, this, this, this much variety in stories. I fell in love with characters like Spider-Man. I grew up with Batman, the animated series. These things yep. shape who I am to this day. Eventually, I, uh, I went to school for animation. I got a degree in media arts and animation because of shows like Batman, the animated series, also because of shows like Animaniacs and Tiny Toons. And a lot of those people were the same people working on the shows. Of back course. Then. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I grew up loving cartoons and I grew up loving comics. And I was really lucky that the thing that I invested in when I was a kid uh, which when I was a kid wa was relegated to like a few live action movies. About half of them were good, right? I'm talking about the, the <laughs> Christopher Reeve Superman and the Tim Burton Batman. Right. And, and I was coming up with the age of like Batman Forever is coming out and Batman and Robin. Right. And we took what <laughs> yeah. we got. We took what right. we got, you know? We right, right. Uh, but it was mostly relegated to the worlds of comics and cartoons. And I invested in this thing and, and, I, w I am so blown away still to this day that that now, it, as I was coming up in high school and college, that it has blown into blown up into the best and sort of greatest uh, sector of pop culture right now. With, with I know it's, it's so strange, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely insane. I have I have to ask a couple questions. So one. Living in San Diego, did you see like New York as this mythical other place? Yes, Rich, absolutely. <laughs> because to me, it was the same as Gotham City. It was a right. place that I had never been to. And and a little personal background about me: I didn't uh, I didn't travel that much when I was a kid, and and I didn't get on an airplane until I was twenty six. So oh, wow. when I took family vacations, when I was growing up, it was either like, you know, we took a trip once to Napa Valley up in Northern California. We, we yeah. drove, we took a trip right. to San Francisco, took a trip to Las Vegas and my family being from Mexico, I would vacation a lot in Mexico. We'd go to beaches down in, 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 um, in Baja and, and all that kind of stuff. So it did feel like another world for me. It felt as, 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 um, a kind of supernatural and mystical and, and otherworldly as like Middle Earth or as like, you know, Hogwarts, these places you could never go. 
Yeah. So when I was 26 years old, I, I said, you know what? I'm going to take a vacation from work. I can afford to. And I'm just going to book a plane ticket and I'm going to fly to New York. And I crashed on my buddy's couch. My buddy who was, we were oh, college wow. friends in, uh, in, in San Diego. And he was nice enough to like, like invite me and let me. And for like four days in 2014, I'll never forget it because it was the opening weekend of uh, the most recent at the time Spider-Man movie, which was The Amazing Spider-Man 2 with Andrew right. Garfield. Like opening weekend in May for like four or five days, I, would, I, I just walked around New York. And I just went to all of the places that I had grown up knowing and loving. And it, w- and it was as real to me as it was like stepping into a movie or stepping into a comic book. Cause it's not just superheroes, but like New York has been in dozens of movies that, that, that are, that are staples sure. of popular culture. So you grow up and I'm like, yeah, I know that building. I know that building. I know that street. I know this, you know, subway exit. I know, I right. know all of this stuff. So, so it was like a, a complete joy for me to be able to do that. And, um, and I, I think and it's, I, yeah. I think it's funny because, so I grew up in small town Kentucky and I remember reading advertisements and comics for San Diego Comic Con. Yeah. <laughs> so where, where you grew up right. was that place for me. I was like, California, people don't live in California. They, they, <laughs> they turn California on in the morning when people go to work and then they turn it off when they leave, right? Cause that's right, where they right. make movies or whatever. So it's so interesting to me to hear you talking about like living in San Diego where I live now. Mm-hmm. which was like a goal for me to get to. Mm-hmm. And you were looking, it's always that there's something, you know, you know the place you're at, Yep. but there can be something magical and mystical about, about the, uh, you know, some other place. Absolutely. And that you would go and, and have that kind of emotional experience wandering around New York is awesome. Yeah. And the irony is not lost on me either, because I knew that, uh, especially when I got to my high school years where Comic-Con started to become the thing that it is today. Right. Yeah, that, that I was that I was at the, the pop culture mecca, and I had been growing up there. And so for years, every that one week in July, it was like, oh, this is, this is awesome. <laughs> I get to go downtown and see, yeah. you know, walk around and like, I would I would see have, have celebrity sightings and I would walk around and I would run into like, because I'm such a comic book nerd and animation nerd, I would recognize those hardworking behind the scenes people, comic book writers, comic book artists, you know, yeah. animators, directors, people that now there's there's even more celebrity, thankfully, attached to them and people follow yeah. their work. But again, growing up in the nineties and early two thousands, like that wasn't always super common. I I had great experiences where one of my favorite writers of all time, Robert Kirkman, who created The Walking Dead and he wrote Invincible and, and he's done a yeah. ton of other stuff. Uh, he was just walking around Comic Con. This was before he sold The Walking Dead as a TV show, and I got to run into him and tell him how much his work meant to me, and he was super nice. And then years and years later, I get to do stuff occasionally with Skybound Entertainment, and like he, you know, he knows who I am, and he's like, "Oh, hey, Hector!" Like, every, like when he's asked me to like host a panel or two for Skybound, yeah. and I'm like, "This is this is my- surreal, right?" Because to me, I'm still this kid from Chula Vista, California. It's a suburb of San Diego. Yeah, that I feel like these kinds of, this kind of stuff was, was sort of always going to be out of my reach. And I was so lucky that the stuff that I invested in, along with, I started doing improv comedy at a pretty young age in San Diego. Uh, Those two skills, like being a nerd and loving this stuff. And then also like being able to perform and talk to people and interview people and be on stage and make stuff up on the fly, that improv skill set when I moved to Los Angeles for work and then I had opportunities to do this kind of work, the stuff that I'm doing now where I'm hosting and interviewing people and, and appearing on panels talking about, you know, Batman beyond or whatever. Like I just, it just so happened to line up and I'm, I'm in, in the right place at the right, right time. And I'm so fortunate and so thankful and so lucky. And, but I always do feel like rich. I'm still this kid from San Diego who was like, I've never, yeah. I've never been anywhere. I don't know anything, you know? So that's kind of it's, my background. Again, it's one of those things where I'm thinking like, you you lived in Chula Vista. I know where Chula Vista is. I go there all the time, yep. if not for work, for for friends that live there. Yeah. And it's still San, like this San Diego area. And you being from here and me being from this small town, you know, back back east, I would look at you being out here and saying, oh, look how lucky he is. He's so right there, right next to it. Sure. And yet somehow we don't have those that self-awareness wherever we are. We always think about what's elsewhere. And there yeah. is some fascination to that, but there's also some recognition of where you are, right? Where you are in your your world and not taking that for granted. Like there, we don't always have to go 
too far out of our way to to find some of those things that fascinated us. Absolutely. I want to back up a little bit and I want to talk about your um, this degree in media and animation. Yeah. So what does that mean to you? Are, so are, are you an artist? Is this degree in media and animation about production side stuff? Like what, what does it involve? It is about production side stuff. I went to, okay. the, um, to the Art Institute of California in San Diego, that mm-hmm. branch of it. And I guess it's like a trade school or like a technical school. I got a degree in three years as opposed to four, but it's like a legit bachelor's degree. And when I graduated, I guess my focus was in storyboarding again, because I love comic books. And so right. uh, that's I think that, the, that's that bridge. Absolutely. You know, and we've talked to several storyboarders on, on the show. Whitney Tang was just on recently talking yeah. about it. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, but it, ultimately, when I got out of college, because the animation industry really isn't in San Diego, I was living at home with my folks. I got a job doing post-production at a, at a studio that, did, that worked on movies but they were doing post stuff. And so my animation kind of skills stuff went away. So what I basically use it for now, because on top of my like technical training or whatever, it was also just three years of like learning about how animation works, learning about how, how media, you know, how, 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 how like production and stuff works. So if I'm using that degree today, I'm using it because I'm using it in a way where it's like, where it's like, I, I know, sort of how this stuff works and I can speak to it with some level of, of understanding and I've studied yeah. it and I'm continuing to study it. Even though I'm, I don't work in animation, I'm constantly getting my hands on, on art books and, and, and I'm reading animation magazine and I'm watching every bit of like behind the scenes, special features, making of stuff that I can. And, and uh, I'm, I'm, I immerse myself in it, even if I don't, you know, even if I'm not an animator, um, right. I still am trying to keep up with that side of, of, of this creative industry that I love the same as with comic books, the same as with, you know, movies and TV shows and stuff like that. So that's, that's, that's kind of what I do, I guess. Well, it, it gives you a common frame of reference in which right. to relate to some of the, you know, you're talking to, I don't know who, you know, Bruce Tim or Paul Dini or, or somebody who's actually in it, in the, in the trenches mm-hmm. and you can, you can kind of see things from their perspective with this shared frame of reference. And I think that's important. But, yeah. but speaking of that, I mean, I'm, there are many people out there getting degrees in media and animation. <laughs> They're not hosting DC daily show. So, right. 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 So, so there's a story where well, there's a story there. What's that story? How did you get into this position where you happen to be right now? The story is there's like a couple of different steps. Step one, like I said, I graduated college. I got this job working in post-production in San Diego. Eventually that job went away because the work went away and I was let go. And uh, it was the first time that happened and not the last, but that happens when you work in, in industries like that. And I was in my 20s and it didn't quite rattle me, but I was like, oh, okay, cool. This could happen. There's no, there's no permanence with, you know, with a production right. job. Got it. Right. Moved to Los Angeles to do the same thing. What the job was, was uh, working in 3D post conversion. Okay. So I was at a company, I was at a company that with huge teams of people would convert regular 2D movies into 3D movies after the film was shot. And on top of that, you're compositing. A lot of times you still get 3D or CG like 3D elements. Uh, I, I worked on movies like the, the first couple of Shrek movies. They reconverted those into 3D and DreamWorks hired our company to do it. I worked on the Avengers. I worked on Iron Man 3. I got my name in the credits of Iron Man 3 and I was very excited about that. I also worked on some movies that are not great like the Smurfs and Transformers <laughs> Dark of the Moon. And, 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 and I've had some experiences where a, a couple things happened when I was working on Iron Man three, I was also working on Star Trek into darkness at the same time. And I'm a huge Trekkie. Yeah. And I was so excited. I'm like, I get to see footage from the new Star Trek movie before anybody else. And this is, this is what it is to work in post-production. And this is so great. This is so cool. We would start getting the footage in and I was learning about the film and I being like the only Trekkie on my team. I was asking my supervisors, I'm like, wait, so is this the character that Benedict Cumberbatch is playing? Is he, is this, is this what the story is? Is this what it is? Is this what it is? And he was kind of like, uh, uh, yeah, I think so. I guess. I don't know. Like, you know, just like he didn't. Yeah. Really care. And I was like, no, oh, okay. And then I learned it's very frustrating to be in post-production if you're trying to be like a storyteller, like you, cause you have, right. no, you just get the movie and it's, you know, whether it's going to be good or bad, it's not up to you just contributing to the, the sort of finishing touches, the polishing, whatever, what, however you want to look at it. 
Right. And some of it can contribute to the storytelling. I, I know that not a lot of people are fans of 3D movies. I'm a huge fan. I'm a proponent. I'm a defender because because it's a it's an industry that's it's a side of the of the movie world that a lot of people I think uh, kind of misunderstand. They're not as knowledgeable. They're not as aware of it. And like you said earlier, I was somebody who was in the trenches. I was working on these kinds of films. I, I got to work on a little bit of when they converted the original Jurassic Park into 3D. And that, that was a dream for me because Jurassic Park was this huge touchstone in my young life where I learned about the power of storytelling and the power of movie making. That movie yeah. like broke open my brain and rearranged it. And, and, I, yeah. and I owe so much to it. So I got to touch it a little bit. I got to work on a couple of shots and they put them into 3D. And when I would tell people that I worked on it, people have misconceptions about 3D conversion. They assume that every job is a rush job. It's just that something Hollywood does to tack on to a movie to up the, the ticket price. And that was true in the year 2010 when there were two bad movies that came out that had that attached to it. But people still believe that that's sort of how the, that works. And I have to tell people they work for nine months like converting Jurassic Park frame by frame. Like it's a gorgeous job. It's super cool. Steven Spielberg himself oversaw that job and like made sure that it looked the way that it did when he shot it in 1992 in Hawaii. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I'm a big defender of, of, of 3d as storytelling every once in a while too. It, it, it leaves a major impact. I know a lot of people still remember Avatar and that being their first sort of modern 3D movie experience and what it contributed to the storytelling. And I'll never forget, too, I worked on The Avengers and the director, Joss Whedon, he shot a scene with Jeremy Renner as Hawkeye as he was sort of coming back from being mind controlled by Loki. And he said in the director commentary, and he told us when he came and visited the studio, he said, what you guys did in 3D to just put that whole sequence that scene in 3D made me realize more of the acting details that Jeremy Renner was, was, was doing like that. I didn't realize were there and that it enhanced what that scene, what that small little scene was sort of doing. And I really oh, wow. appreciated that stuff. I really like that. So, nice. but it was still this, this back and forth of like, you're working on movies and that's glamorous and exciting and cool. You're also sometimes working 12 hours a day. It's a machine. A lot of the times these companies, you know, they're not as concerned with the rights or well-being of like a particular single artist, but they just need to get this stuff done. That's how it works. And, and at one point they uh, were outsourcing a lot of the jobs and work to Canada and I didn't want to move to Canada. So I went, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to work in a different industry. Okay. I had an opportunity talking about post-production versus pre-production, and I wanted to work on some pre-production side of something. I had an opportunity to go work at a voice acting agency to be the assistant of a, of an, of a voice acting agent whose clients are voice actors that get work. And so I worked at that job because I wrote in my cover letter, I talk about how much Kevin Conroy and his voice of Batman meant to me yeah. in my life and how much I w still love and enjoy and watch cartoons and superhero cartoons and after school stuff and stuff that's geared towards kids. I still watch it and I still appreciate it. So I got the job and I was probably the only person who worked at that office who like actually watched, you know, for fun, not for work, uh, <laughs> the cartoons that, that their clients were in or, or the cartoons that were they're being made at the time. So my job then became, we would get an audition for a role and if the audition had anything to do with anything I might be familiar with, like, oh, hey, Hector, we just got this audition for this character called the Winter Soldier. Do you know what this is? And I'd be like, <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact, I know everything about that character. Let me give you a rundown. More than just what might be nice. provided in, in the copy to, to sort of help them pick and choose which one of their clients could audition for that role and then maybe book it. So, wow, wow. so, it was, so there was an element of pre-production happening because you could be part of a conversation of casting. We, yeah part of a conversation of what, what, ki what kinds of talent would be great for this, which I think is also like an undervalued faction of Hollywood and entertainment is the casting departments. I think that good casting can, can make a movie incredible. And, um, and it's, it takes a lot of talent and it takes a lot of really unique and cool skill, which is great. So I did, I did that and ultimately decided after a, a year and a half, two years, I was like, I don't know if I want to be an agent but I still love this side of the industry. So it was at the end of that journey that I had another opportunity. So this is step three where a friend of mine said, Hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working at this company. It's called geek and sundry. I have a budget. How much would it take for you to quit your nine to five and then come do this full time? Oh, wow. And I said, okay. 
I said it would take this amount and I, you know, slid a little <laughs> piece of paper, right. I guess, across it. <laughs> did that movie scene, right? Did that movie scene. Written on a napkin. Yeah. It's absolutely. And my good buddy, Mr. Zach Eubank, who is now in charge of Hyper RPG, which is his own company, um, uh, with his wife, Malika, they're lovely people. He, he had, he was like, I can afford that with this budget. So I was thankfully able to, to commit to doing this kind of work full time. And again, the whole time, all of these years, I'm, I'm doing improv in Los Angeles, which has this amazing improv comedy scene and For sure. yeah. it's an art form. And it's something that's really studied and broken down and rearranged and, and, and looked at at every angle. And I so appreciate that whole side of it too. So, so I brought my improv chops to, this kind of like live streaming content, you know, interviewing and, and, and talk showy type stuff. And then also just brought my passion of, of knowing the stuff that I know and growing up with it and, and, um, you know, having submersed myself in the world of superheroes since I was five and I have yet to come up for air. So that's, so that's how I ended up, you know, and I don't think I ever will. Uh, so that's how I ended up in that journey to where I am today. That's fascinating. It, it, uh, we've talked about this a lot on the show with a lot of different people. It's participating. Mm-hmm. You're out and you're doing work. You've got, you've clearly got, I, I didn't know any of this background about you. So this is, yeah. this is, you've got, you've got degree, you got a degree, you, you worked in different fields. You use that degree to some extent, but you also experienced other aspects of things and just found your place. And when that opportunity came up, mm-hmm. your preparation was available to take that spot, Absolutely. you know? Absolutely. I think it's really important. Well, when we were we were chatting, you mentioned to me that you came into Young Justice a little bit later yeah. than some. When did when did you first see the show? When it was on I, Netflix? I first saw the show. No, not when it was on Netflix. I can't remember how much of a gap there was between like when the show was off the air and when it got onto Netflix. But I think at some point it was year. It was several it was, couple it was years. A couple yeah. years. So at some point, I believe season two had already ended, or maybe it was in the middle of season two even. And I decided I need to catch up on the show. People are saying it's great. And I got, because I still have to this day, Netflix disc through the mail. Like they'll send me a, a DVD yeah. in the mail <laughs> because I, I, again, I love physical media. And, and, and when people are like, oh, this thing isn't on Netflix. I'm like, yeah, but they have it through the mail. Like you could just ask them to send you this movie and you only need one movie at a time. And it's, you know, it's like seven bucks a month or I don't know how much it is but in addition yeah. to streaming stuff. But I had them send me disc one of season one of Young Justice and I watched it and I dug it. And then I got up to about episode 13 and I had already decided, I'm like, this is a fantastic show. And for whatever reason, it kind of got away from me. I got distracted with stuff, maybe because it wasn't as easy as finding a streaming service and clicking it and just watching the next episode. But, um, but I had already decided, I'm like, this is great. I need to go back and, and, and do like the whole thing. And when both seasons were, were out and then the show was effectively canceled, it was always a part of my plan to like, to go back and revisit it. Because even though a show goes away, I still, especially if it's praise as much as Young Justice was, like I love Green Lantern, the animated series. You know, it's oh, absolutely. One and done. It's one season and I'll still tell people to like go check it out. Um, but then when I heard that miraculously it was coming back for season three, I went, perfect. This is my excuse to finally go back. And I'm really lucky that I did not have to wait the, the <laughs> years that all of the Young Justice fans had to wait, right? I'm, I, I knew how lucky I was. I was like, oh, perfect. I've been busy doing other stuff. I can just now get into it and then be caught up by the time season three drops, right? So that's what right. I ended up doing. And and it was like mind-blowing how 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 invested I got into uh, the, the universe of Young Justice just after that those two seasons and how how rich and how full each of those episodes are to like, to like go back and revisit and talk about stuff. And, and so, yeah, I totally appreciate what you guys have been doing on the podcast and, and uh, you know, I don't think that something like this would work for every cartoon show, even though I love many other shows. I I think Mm -hmm. that that young justice brings a lot to the, to the table of um, in terms of superhero storytelling that is really unique and cool. I I agree with you. I don't, uh, we've been asked to do, you know, if we're going to do Whelm style, podcast about other shows right. and they can be done it's just going to have to be handled a little differently 
because there are not that many shows that can handle the weight of the deep dive that we do on the sh- on the show. Right. Um, absolutely. So um, we agree, I agree with you. So so we, we brought you on the show to learn more about you, but we also brought you on the show to talk about some stuff. Yeah. And uh, you and I geeked out uh, about a lot of things uh, in mm-hmm. between sh- in between shoots when uh, we were uh, kindly asked to come up and do some recording with you guys. Yeah. And uh, but one of the things that I one of the many things that I found fascinating about some of our chats was the discussion that we had about timelines. Yes. Not just the timeline in Young Justice, but how timelines are handled in different comic companies because of the uniqueness of this particular medium. Because Absolutely. comics, when you have characters who are 80 years old, like Batman and, and Robin, these characters have evolved, you know, into different versions, you know, so swingy from one, one side of an idea to another side of an idea over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, but how do you how do you look at a character like Bruce and say, oh, yeah, he's what, 38 with five kids? Like, mm-hmm. how does that work out? Like, mm-hmm. that doesn't seem right. You know, it's like, oh, OK, well, there's all these other characters that have been introduced over time. Or one of the things that we've talked about is um, Dick Grayson, where Dick Grayson over his even just since he's turned Nightwing, became Nightwing in the 80s has had multiple monogamous relationships that in the comics have lasted years. Right. But then you now get him to a point right now, like in Young Justice, where they portray so many of those as actually canon, but he's only <laughs> in his early 20s. So then it starts looking like, wait a minute, he, oh, was with Star- he-, he was with Starfire for like five years in my memory. Right. But she's not even one of them in the show. <laughs> and, you know what I mean? So it starts to make him look a little. So how timelines work and how you do that and then how they chose to do this in Young Justice and the implications of those timelines. Yes. You when we started talking about this, you lit up. Oh, yeah. This is this is a thing I love to geek out about because. I am a big fan of uh, of fictional, like fictional worlds reference materials. I love encyclopedias about pop culture stuff that's not real. Like I love to learn <laughs> as many as many details as possible, and that's how I became, in, for me at least, uh, as as I think as knowledgeable as I am about the superhero worlds because they are so daunting and overwhelming. It's never been about oh you have to read every comic book every week that comes out from these big companies. No, no, no. You just got to get your hands on on the who's who in the DC universe or the official handbook of the Marvel universe and read that thing cover to cover and you will know everything. Yeah. So one of my favorite things I'm going to, this is a little show and tell here. I brought this is this right here. I'm holding up to a camera that Rich can see. (laughs) Right. Yeah. The official handbook of the Marvel universe. Yeah, absolutely. This is volume two of like a 14 uh, volume uh, series. It's like a real encyclopedia. Came out in 2008, and I want to read something to you because this thing has 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 been in, at the forefront of my comic book thinking since I read it, and I love it so much. But but this is volume two. It's A to Z, official handbook of the Marvel Universe. In the very back of each of these volumes, they have like an appendix and things that will explain either comic book concepts or or whatever, right? And in this appendix, they actually have a thing that, that tells you about every like alternate universe within the Marvel universe, right? It has a little description for like, this is Earth 148, which was seen in this comic book, and this is what it is. This is Earth 267, which is seen in this comic book, and this is what it is. But yeah. even though we're talking Young Justice, I believe that these sort of concepts can be applied to DC Comics and the DC Comics multiverse and how DC Comics uses time in its storytelling. So I'm just going to read a little thing here real quick. And again, this is of 2008. So this is 11 years ago. So this might already have to have been updated or done away with or whatever, but I still love that this is real. The earth 616 reality, which as we know is like the regular Marvel universe, like the mainstream regular one features a sliding time scale, meaning that rather being fixed to any date in history, the modern era or Age of Heroes, starting with the Fantastic Four space flight and continuing on to the present. And in the world of DC, that that modern era or the Age of Heroes would probably be when Clark Kent first appears as Superman, right. probably, right? Like that's always like yeah. the initial incident, that first sort of... Now there's, there's the variations on that. Batman, the animated series, premiered first. So he was running around Gotham. And then when we got to Superman, the animated series, Ma Kent said, I don't want you wearing a mask like that nut in Gotham running around, you know, right. so like there's, there's some differences in the order, but it's usually Superman. And with Marvel, it's usually the Fantastic Four. So that Age of Heroes, which continues to the present, is instead 
a roughly 13-year period of time that slides forward. The space flight stays around 13 years ago, regardless of the current year. This means that while Fantastic Four number one came out in 1967, the characters in the story have not aged 47 or now 57 years since that story. While there are some distinct aberrations, such as Peter Parker's sophomore through senior year high school occurring over two to three years of real time, which is a little odd, as of 2008, you can roughly assign four to five years of real time to each year in the Marvel Universe. Right. So now that kind of explains, like you were saying, Rich, if Nightwing in my brain was going out with Starfire for five years, you could yeah. kind of translate that to like, OK, I guess they went out for a year in his time in the way that yeah. time works in comic books. Right. They went out for a year. Um, while some characters such as Captain America, Nick Fury, Wolverine, etc., have real ties to certain periods in history, many references to dates are topical, meaning they were only used to be relevant to the story at the time it was printed. There are those who speculate that, okay, well, first of all, just to expand on that, I'll give you a great example is Iron Man. When he first right. appeared, it was, uh, he was a, a war profiteer dealing with the Vietnam War. And since yes. then, it's been updated to the, the war in the Middle East and so on and so forth. Um, and here's a little interesting sentence that they put in this encyclopedia. Again, because these are fun to read. There are those who speculate that this sliding time scale and time compression is, in fact, being caused by a reality manipulator inside or outside the Earth 616 dimension. So that's just a fun little bit of comic book. Uh, <laughs> that, like, if, any, if any writer at Marvel read that, that they could go, oh, maybe I can explain. Maybe there could be an in-universe reason for why Peter Parker isn't like a 67-year-old man right. by, you know, by attributing it to like the Beyonder or something, some cosmic level character that can manipulate time. So, right. so when I read that 10 years ago, 11 years ago, that made me understand like, okay, that's how superhero comic books work. There is mm -hmm. an element of time. Like you were saying, characters have evolved. Dick Grayson has went, gone from Robin to Nightwing. You know, Bruce Wayne has been Batman for years, but there's still, there's rarely like hard dates presented in these comic book storylines. A couple of examples I can think of are like when the DC Comics universe was rebooted in 2011 with the new 52 Many of those series were sort of issue number one in Action Comics and Justice League started with like, okay, here's the first adventure of these characters or this character. But many of the comics were just like, and we're up to speed now. It's been five years. And so they provided this five-year gap of like, okay, everything that you kind of know about DC comic characters has kind of happened within five years. And now we're up to speed and now let's just keep going. And that's fascinating to me because like you were saying, Rich, there were a lot of questions from comic fans, from DC fans going, okay, so wait. So Barbara Gordon, she's now Batgirl. She's got this new series, Batgirl issue number one. But within that series, she talks about when she was in a wheelchair and she somehow, yeah. you know, she, she, she gained the ability uh, to walk again. She gained her, the use of her legs again, but she did go through being Oracle. She did go through being shot and paralyzed by the Joker. Does that mean that Batman the Killing Joke happened? Did it happen a little bit differently? Lots of these kinds of questions with, with these right. major points of continuity. And I know a lot of people get hung up on continuity, whether it matters, whether it's important, whether canon matters. And those two terms are, to me, they signify the sort of the, 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 the very specified nitty gritty details of, of comics or whatever world that you live in. At the end of the day, no, that stuff doesn't matter. What matters is like bigger picture, it doesn't matter. What matters is storytelling. It's always about story. It's always about, are you serving these characters right? Are you telling a good story? That should always supersede anything. At the same time, things like Young Justice, things like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the, the, you know, the experiment of having these movies linked together, right. their adherence to canon and to continuity has provided storytelling opportunities that otherwise wouldn't be there. Young Justice kind of proves canon is king. Young Justice kind of proves that continuity can be looked at and used as a tool to enhance your storytelling that is unique to that, that like isn't really available in other versions of these characters, whether they're comics or other cartoon shows or even movies and stuff. So, so that's what I love about Young Justice is this hard date. You know, they set things up. They tell you what time of day the events are happening. They tell right. you what date during the calendar year they're happening. And all of that stuff, it, it, it feels like it's behind the scenes because when you watch the show casually, you might not notice it. You might not pay attention to it. But for those fans, 
that are, you know, taking notes and writing things down and putting things together in a timeline and figuring stuff out. There are like little bits and nuggets of, of, of revelations in that and, and ramifications and fans go, Oh my gosh, you know what this means? This means this, and this means this. And it's yeah. just like added detail that the creators of young justice have put in there for the people that are really, really paying attention. And it pays off in, in big picture stuff, but it pays off even in like, even within one episode. Um, one of my favorite episodes is, is season three, the, the way that they use it, which is triptych. Uh, yeah. And how the storytelling, it's like memento. It's like, right. you know, it's a Christopher Nolan movie. It's, it's <laughs> right. done in its inception where you're going, wait, if you were paying attention, you would know that the first part they're showing you doesn't happen until after the third part. And, you know, to kind of piece it together is very satisfying. And if you're paying yeah. attention, you will know that in real time as you're watching the episode, which has got to be, it reminds me of this thing that happened, Rich. I'm a big fan of the show Lost. Yeah. Uh, a big, big fan of the show. And uh, when the show was on, and I even like the finale too, I'll defend the finale. I thought that it was great. But uh, when the show was on the air, my buddy who got me into the show, uh, because I got into that as well late and on DVD and everything, he noticed during the season three finale, the season three finale was a big deal because it was the first time that they showed you, you know, the whole show was based on having flashbacks happen during each episode. It didn't inform you about the character and they kind of tie into what they're dealing with on the island at the time or whatever. Right. Season three finale is happening and there are flashbacks that you think are, okay, this is regular. It's flashback, right? It's, it's the main character and he's got a beard and I don't know what's going on. I don't know when this was happening in his life before he crashed on this island. And by the end of the episode, you realize it's a flash forward. And this is them after they've returned from the island. And it, you know, it was like, whoa, what's happening? It was huge. My buddy, Aaron, who was into the show, he realized this because he was paying attention, and at one point during one of these flashbacks, which we didn't know was a flash forward, the main character, Jack Shepard, he uses a Motorola Razor phone, okay. a cell phone. That cell phone came out after 2004, which was when the plane crash happened within the world of Lost. It crashed in September of 2004, Oceanic Flight 815 landed on the island. So my buddy knew that that phone, and he, and he was like, that was not a mistake. You know, he wasn't, he he was thinking this wasn't just like a production error. Like they're very aware of this stuff. So sure enough, by the end of the episode, he was right. Cause he was like, I think this is a flash forward and he was right. And that, and that's that thing where it pays off to, to know about this stuff and pay attention to this stuff. And it can happen in real time. And that's so exciting as somebody who's just a viewer, somebody who's just, you know, absorbing this stuff to, to, to interact with it at that level is so cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right, so you were you were so you're talking about uh, you, you pulled out this Marvel book specifically, mm-hmm. and you had mentioned this to me when we were talking before about this. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if you call it canon, but like speci- Marvel has specifically said, okay, we get that comics w- are weird with timelines, <laughs> right? We right. get that. Yes, no matter what we're going to do, Robin has always had the little Peter Pan outfit at some point. Like that's not going to change. That's a thing, you, pretty much. Yeah. So. But but Marvel has addressed this with this 13-year sliding scale, which is an interesting choice of numbers. I don't know yes. how they came up with that. Uh, I'm sure there's a reason. But I, it, it does still make me wonder about something like, okay, well, Nick Fury and Cap in World War II is a problem. Mm-hmm. Like, when is that going to jump? I mean, is it going to be 50 years and they're going to jump from World War II to the Iraq War? Or like, what are they going to, how are they going to do this? Or is he I, going to be woken up much later? And is Nick Fury going to take more, take more serum to make him young so he can participate? Or yeah. I'm not sure how that's going to work. But then in addition to those questions, which we can talk to a bit about that, let's pull it back to DC a little bit yes. and talk about, talk about it related to DC. Like one, do you, do you know if DC has made any like declarations like Marvel has with this or if it's in, it's just implied and and the second part of that like I'm talking about with Captain America looking at young justice specifically what are these implications of okay how old is Jason Todd is he 16 17 mm-hmm. in the scene we saw him and Damien's a, a baby and so in 10 years when Damien's 10 and he's Robin does that mean Jason's 28 and Dick's mm-hmm. in his 30. Like what, what, this is not how the comic books show the relationship between Dick, Grayson, Damien, Tim, you know? That's so, true. so let's talk about that. Let's, let's go back. Do you know if DC has made any statements about this let's, sliding? Scale? Yeah. Let's hit that first. As far as I know, I believe, no, I think that the answer to the question, 
who is more concerned with continuity overall between Marvel and DC? I think the answer is Marvel. I think that Marvel is in a unique position that, like I mentioned in that encyclopedia entry, their first initial inciting incident, the flight, space flight of the Fantastic Four, which happened in a comic book that was released in 1961, up to this point has been one continuous you know, soap opera storytelling experiment uh, for all of those years. They're in a unique position because DC doesn't have that. The DC history flip side of that is that they have had these hard reboots every sort of generation, it feels like. The one in 1986 right. with Crisis on Infinite Earths, where they sort of first cleaned house and put everything together, smashed all their universes together into one universe. And then that universe existed from 1986 until 2011 with the New 52, where they sort of did it again and, and, and started everything from scratch. Their, their original very first universe was Action Comics number one with the debut of Superman in 1938. And that universe existed until like 1955 when Barry yep. Allen Flash first showed right. up. And, and that's that, where we've yeah. talked to – sorry to interrupt you, but this is where we talked about this on the show. That's where yeah. they tried to modernize these old characters and you mm -hmm. get these – okay, we're not going to have the Alan Scott magical Green Lantern anymore. We're going to do this Lensman-like Green mm -hmm. Lantern Space Corps, which is really cool. Like yes. they're, they're, they, it, it, they evolved into these science heroes almost, like the Barry yes. Allen with the science experiment and the space Green Lanterns. And, uh, okay, well, now we have a Black Canary, but who is the original Black Canary? Okay, that was in Justice Society. So this is where that happened in the, in, in the mid-50s, you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. So with that debut of Barry Allen, that was the beginning technically of that new DC universe where with all these heroes are being modernized and updated and turned into sci-fi and they're leaning into that more so than the myth and legends of like the golden age superhero characters. Um, even within that Barry Allen reality, there was a new Superman. There was a new Batman, a new Wonder Woman, because then they went back and said, okay, the older characters that you remember, the Jay Garrick Flash, the Alan Scott Green Lantern, that were active during World War II, they are still alive, but they live in another plane of reality. And we're going to call Earth that two. Earth 2. And the first yeah. time that happened was when The Flash popped over there by accident and realized he was in what he grew up with as a comic book, right? He's in a reality where it's like, wait a minute, I, this is this is The Flash's city right. from The Flash comics. And he went and met Jay Garrick and he's like, you're a fictional character where I'm from, you know, and I'm The Flash in my reality. And then right. since then, it's been a part of DC's legacy is that they are like a multiverse which is really cool i grew up with the, i grew up with justice league comics where it was like they'd always they had this like anniversary get together where awesome. they would where they would bring the justice society it's like oh this year it's on the watchtower and they'd bring mm -hmm. the justice society over and they'd have these like bonding moments and there was a uh, th there's a whole uh, storyline with um paradigaton going between worlds and doing stuff and like it would be like three roll calls across yep. the way with the all-star squadron and justice society and justice league and i was like god this universe is huge and there's so, so much cool. going on what which I, also yeah. led to them going like it's too big we gotta it crush is. we gotta crush yeah. there's earth s shazam and there's right you know right so they so it's so interesting too because and also just real quick one of my favorite moments in comic book history is the crossover jla avengers or avengers jla depending on which right. you get where they replaced the Justice Society with the Avengers. And they made it so that there was like a retroactive history where the Justice League and the Avengers would once a year meet up and have like a barbecue or something or like a Hawaiian, <laughs> you know, like a Hawaiian barbecue and meet up and have this little adventure and stuff, which is so fun. But, but yeah, that, that, that crisis on infinite earths was the moment where DC said, we have all these different earths and different universes. Like you said, the Shazam planet, the, or the Shazam Earth, we have the Charleston characters that we acquired. Right. Like they live on an Earth, like Blue Beetle and and Captain Adam and everything. The question, yeah, the question. So then when they when they cleaned house and brought everything together in 1986, they said, okay, there is only one Superman, and we're going to give you the John Byrne series, The Man of Steel, to sort of redefine his origin, so that we can get to the comic books. If you go and pick up a regular comic book series that's Superman and we're off and racing, but he did have now we're trying to update the origin. It was not in 1938. It was not in 1955. It was now. And that's where Batman year one came from, right? The, yep. the classic Frank Miller series and also wonder woman by George Perez. He sort of redefined the character as well. So from 86 until 2011, even then there were slight tiny little minor reboots mini reboots, mini, you know, changes to reality. Uh, Superman Birthright was a series that came out by Mark Wade, the writer who they redefined Superman's origin yet again in a modern context. And then even since then, 
I think a little bit after, a little bit before 2011, uh, Jeff Johns and Gary Frank did Superman Secret Origin, which yet again redefined his origin and said, now this is the official one so that Superman Birthright became like an Elseworlds story. And that's a whole other thing too, the Elseworlds and the different, you know, the Dark Knight. Right, and yeah, Earth for sure. And Kingdom Come and all these different universes. So it all seems overwhelming, but the point I'm trying to make is that throughout DC Comics history, they have done these hardline, full-on reboot done. Marvel, right. as was just explained, even though they have characters that are tied to World War II, like Captain America, like you mentioned, Wolverine was active then, right? And um, and Magneto, which I think is an important one too. People forget about that for sure. Absolutely, Magneto being being a survivor of the Holocaust, they still have. Um, they've also had little mini reboots throughout, like Tony Stark Iron Man. Right? You read a comic book now, and his origin was if it's 13, 14, 15 years ago, that's the war in the Middle East that he was in Afghanistan, kind of like the the you know, Robert Downey Jr. movie. Um, so then also just to side point out the the question you had about those certain characters, I feel that a lot of those characters I just mentioned and a couple other ones will, no matter how far into the future Marvel comics will go, I think that they'll always have Captain America be a survivor of World War II and that he just he, he continues to just be frozen for longer and longer and longer. When he was first thought right. out, it was 1964. So it was only 20 years. Yeah, so still a long time, but 20 years was like people reading comics in 1964, like 20 years ago, you know, maybe their kids weren't born, but they remember when World War II ended and the horrors yeah. of that, of that yeah. of the great war. So, um, so it's just turned into, you've been asleep for 70 years, Cap, you know, that's the new thing. I think that Magneto, because of the importance of what those historical events do for the character will never deviate from from being tied to that. Now, the excuses they came up with are, well, Magneto has rejuvenated his body a couple of times. You know, now he's in the, he's through, through some comic book weirdness and machinations, he's in the body of like a 38-year-old guy, even though he is, you know, super old. And Nick Fury as well, he had uh, this thing that was revealed years ago where when people started to get wise, because again, Nick Fury, when he's meeting Captain America in the 60s, he was like, hey, 20 years ago, I was a young grunt, you know, I was Sergeant Fury in World War II, and, and now yeah. you're here, and I want you to work for S.H.I.E.L.D. and whatever, whatever. But now, if Nick Fury is still the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. in the modern era, and what's cool now is oftentimes he's, he's a black guy now, he's African-American, he's Samuel Jackson or whatever. It, it, if he still was active in World War II, the excuse is, well, now he has a thing in him called the Infinity Formula. It's a, it's a formula that keeps him younger. You know, he doesn't have the same powers as Captain America, but... He's able to age super, super, super slow. Black Widow is another character that was revealed to, to have ties in, in that era. And she's oh. also been allowed to get slow, you know, age slower. Yep. Yeah. There's a there's a great one shot story called uh, called Captain America and Wolverine together again for the first time. So good. And it's so it's where they where they uh, where Logan before he got the adamantine skeleton is mm -hmm. a Canadian agent mm -hmm. who meets Steve Rogers uh, back in World War II, and together they rescue, I think, a potentially uh, about to be kidnapped Black Widow when she was young. Yep. Uh, and it was kid, yeah. it was so good. And there's so many great moments in there. Like they're at a bar, and they and Wolverine or orders like a beer or something, and he's like, he points at Cat at Steve Rogers, and he's like, he'll take what he'll take a, a club soda, and he's like, how do you know? He's like, there aren't many people that I can t that there aren't many people I smell that have no alcohol on them <laughs> from any historical event or whatever. He's That's like, amazing. you've never taken a drink, dude. I can yeah. smell it. <laughs> I was like, this is so cool. And so I do love, I do love those, those connections. And maybe I'm thinking too far in the future, but just like, I feel like that even the, even that uh, disbelief is going to be difficult to suspend for a character, for a character like Wolverine or like Wolverine or cap. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause they, cause they do those things. Right. Mm -hmm. But there aren't any characters. Well, it's not totally true, I guess. I mean, if we are talking about whether the justice society is going to be involved, even modern stories have, have kind of yeah. given this impression that the justice society existed, but members have died. Now, can't canonically in young justice, we do know because of the tie in comics that wildcat's still alive. Great. That Jay Garrick is still alive. We've seen him in the animated series. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, we don't know about Alan Scott. Like we don't know about some of these other characters. We don't know if the Alan Scott Green Lantern 
it's, for those for those of you who don't know, Alan Scott is a Green Lantern. Uh, his ring is works similarly to a, a lantern ring, except it's actually based on magic. And the way they kind of retcon this thing that you might get into when they mash the worlds together was thinking like, oh, okay, so a Green Lantern from the core crash landed on Earth, you know, thousands of years ago, and a magician saw the saw the 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 ring and the uh, lantern and got inspired to create a magical version that ended up being Alan Scott's version right. of the of the ring. So he was kind of where Alan Scott inspired Hal Jordan in the comics. In this way, the Green Lantern Corps inspired the creation of Alan Scott. It's a very cool yes. way to bring these things together, right? Um, but even in modern DC comics, you just don't see Alan Scott very much. You yeah. Know, you, that, that kind of stuff. So It's a real bummer because I'm a huge fan of the Justice Society of America and those yeah. characters, and specifically their ties to World War II into that era. And I love that. And when I was growing up in the, in, you know, I was born in 87. So I'm growing up in the late eighties, early nineties, the comics then still had these characters around, but they were much older. The men and women were obviously retired. Some of them were semi-retired. And then a lot of them had excuses for how their powers had kept them young, right? Jay Garrick's, his, his super speed has sort of allowed him to kind of tap into the speed force, kind of not but also stay young. So he, all the descriptions I read, my various encyclopedias would say, Jay Garrick, even though he's a man of advanced age, has, has sort of the, the physicality of like somebody like maybe in their 50s, you know, right. maybe in their early 60s. So you're like, okay, I could kind of buy that he could still run around and, and be who he is. But they, more importantly, had relationships with the next generation of heroes. Jay yeah. Garrick was a mentor to Barry Allen and Alan Scott was a mentor to Hal Jordan. And in modern DC, that has kind of gone away, and it's probably because we're getting further and further away from from those years. I, I, will, I will point out, I just recently reread one of my favorite comics, which was uh, from 2003, Batman Hush. That's a oh, yeah. story mm-hmm. storyline. Jeff Loeb, Jim Lee does the art. There's this great flashback in it where Bruce Wayne is a little kid visits Metropolis, and he looks up in the sky with his friend, and they both see Alan Scott fighting a villain named the Icicle, but Alan Scott like flies by. You know, yeah. and that was his first. And I love the idea that like Bruce Wayne, Clark Kent, that these characters that we know as being like the forefathers and and the sort of mothers and fathers of the DC universe, they still had a generation that came before them and were maybe yeah. even inspired by them. I love that. Well, maybe that maybe this is this difference here, right? So in in Marvel, uh, Marvel and DC have one big difference between the two of them, mm-hmm. and that's the existence of legacy heroes. Yes, right. We yeah. said it a bunch on the show, but I think. That is something that that might be able to happen with DC as things move forward. That Marvel's like there's there's not a mini Magneto, right? right? There's not a right. there's there there's maybe X twenty three for Wolverine, and that might hand off at some point. But Wolverine mm-hmm. can kind of live forever. You know, mm-hmm. you can you can figure something out with him. But you you've got generations of heroes, right? right. Even like Blue Beetle. Right. Which was who was one of the first legacy heroes because Dan Garrett from the old radio show Blue Beetle. Right. Uh, uh, Ted Cord was a, you know, uh, uh, an apprentice to him in many ways when he died. Mm-hmm. And so there's this handoff thing that can go through generations and has gone through generations. Dan mm-hmm. Garrett is not even a Blue Beetle most people know existed, even though he existed for decades. Yep. True. And then Ted Cord was Blue Beetle for decades. And now it's Jaime. Right. And Ted Cord is the hero who died. Right. So you this is a thing moving forward that maybe DC can do. And it but if they do that, how do we see this in Young Justice? Are we gonna see like the death of Bruce Wayne and the handoff? Oh, I because we could see this. Yes. This is this to bring it all back to Young Justice. The thing that blew me away was the five year time jump between seasons one and two. I mm-hmm. thought that that I mean it's jarring on a, it's jarring on purpose when you see episode one of season two you're like wait what's going on? where what happened to what happened to Connor and McGann what's going on what happened what happened and it's jarring on purpose and it adds to the story and it provides a question and it asks the audience if you stick with us we will answer these questions don't worry and I thought it was brilliant and even the two year gap between seasons two and three I think is is so exciting because we've talked about this Rich is that there is absolutely a possibility. If and when we get season four, season five, season six, season, if they keep going, that there could be these year long time jumps in their timeline between these seasons that could lead to seeing Damian Wayne Robin actually become Robin at around 10 years old, at, you know, 12 years old. We could see these characters inherit 
the the mantle that it was passed on by by the heroes that came before we could see the retiring of certain superheroes probably not wonder woman she's immortal and and maybe not maybe we would see the retirement of batman he has an entire bat family we've seen them they're a part of the show and you blew my mind rich when you were like they could get to a point where we could see a 60 year old batman a 60 year old bruce wayne which might not seem like a significant number but then you remember that's about how old he was in the opening to batman beyond where he has yeah. an advanced suit, is fighting some crime. Some guys that kidnapped a woman. He, uh, the, like, uh, like the, some somebody's daughter. He has a heart attack in the suit. Has to resort to picking up a gun to threaten one of the the, the crooks. He, you know, the crook gets away. He puts down the gun and says, "Never again." And then twenty years after that, Terry McGinnis. But we right. might still see the moment where Bruce decides to retire. And maybe yeah. it'll be a different universe because in the DC animated universe of Batman, the animated series, all the way up to Justice League Unlimited, they didn't lean into this element of the world as much. You know, we didn't have the opening scene of Batman Beyond where, and I think it was on purpose and I think it was really smart because that show was about Terry McGinnis and I love it. But that show, but Young Justice is different because it really is a DC universe show with all of the characters and all the relationships. Yeah. If this, something like this were to happen in, in Young Justice, it would make absolute sense for Bruce Wayne to have a conversation with Dick Grayson, Barbara Gordon, Jason Todd will probably be back and maybe reformed in his red hood at this point, you know, yeah. Tim Drake, all of these right. different characters in his circle to go, I'm hanging up the cape and cowl. I leave it right. in your hands. We might see that. We might. And one of the things that I, one of the things, I think it's one of my favorite things in the Batman Beyond storylines and universe mm -hmm. is when Terry is working with the current incarnation of the Justice League. Yes. Which yes. is, which is still Clark, but he's got like, he's starting to gray. So yeah. he's looking a little, but he's, he's probably going to live hundreds of years. We don't right. know. Right. But then you also get Warhawk, yes. who in that, in that timeline is the, the son of Shayara. Mm -hmm. and John Stewart. Yep. And so we yep. get to see that character and who that character is. We get to see a new Green Lantern who is a mm -hmm. a a I don't know if he was a boy or a girl or or neither. Like they they were young and a Buddhist monk yeah. <laughs> from from the from from the the east. And I was like, what a great like like the meditation and all that stuff. What a great person to choose. Totally. Really interesting person to choose for a Green Lantern. Like there's so much story there was such a rich story that got opened up there. I think even Barda was part mm -hmm. of the modern yeah. Justice League. Yeah. So I don't know how Barda fits in some of this. Totally. But. And also, I think it was Aquaman's daughter. It was Aquaman. Oh, it was. That's right. It was, it it was, was an like Aqua Arthur, Girl version. Yeah, I think it was Arthur Curry's daughter even, which is cool. It was, and she had Mara's powers as well as... Yes. And so she was able to manipulate one. So it, it really opens the door. So when I first saw that time jump, and it was jarring, particularly because the season one finale ended, and they had had so many hiatuses, that there a week later season two opened. So you had this one week to get used to the a five year jump and it right. was very jarring. But as soon as we got into the the first episode, I was like, the implications of this are enormous. Absolutely. If they have more seasons, like uh, my brain yeah. just started running with the new, fresh, interesting stories. We've talked about this. The the idea of getting a story where Billy Batson's in his to like twenty five. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We never see a story where Billy is 20. He's 18 um, in season three. Unless it's Kingdom Come where he's a full grown yep. man. But that's but Kingdom universe. Right. Right. And Kingdom Come is he's a full grown and older and we don't get to see the stories of him Absolutely. at that age and Absolutely. what that means. Like that's yeah. that's amazing to me, much less these other characters we're talking totally. about. Totally. Just to put it in the context, just in the five year gap, for example, if we're applying the comic book logic that we've just established we're borrowing it from Marvel, but we said we can basically apply it to DC Comics as well. That five years could equal around 25 years worth of comic book history. Yeah. Does that make sense? 25 yes. years of comic book history could have happened in between seasons one and two. And a lot can kind of happen in 25 years of comic book history. It's so much. It's so much. And, and so, you know, talking Marvel and DC, Marvel has, has characters that have been allowed to evolve and change a little bit. But as the, the same with DC, these characters and these stories will ultimately be cyclical. And these wonderful characters are kind of stuck being the sort of age that they are and, and the part of their lives that they are. And, and years go by and they'll change a little, but, but it's about keeping them accessible and it's about keeping them. And now they're all owned by these big corporate companies, right? So, so Batman will never be able to, unless it's a, 
a one-off Dark Knight trilogy movie where at the end of that, Christian Bale is allowed to retire. And that's kind right. of rare because we will always need in the comic book world, these characters to be who they are because there will always be comic books and that storytelling engine is just going to keep moving forward. Young right. Justice is so unique because they have established, no, there, there may not, we may not determine if there's going to be an end per se, but we are saying specifically time is progressing. Time is moving forward. Characters are aging. Characters are evolving. And that a- allows them to explore DC legacy in a way that, again, even the comic books haven't, haven't been able to, to their full extent. Every time we get a great Justice Society story in the 90s, in the early 2000s, whatever, you know, the new 52 happened and we're back to sort of square one. And that's, that, that comes with pros and cons. And that's awesome. And that's great that, that we're able to hit the ground running and explore these universes again. But Young Justice is, is, is a show that so far is just two and a half seasons. And it lets people know that they're not keeping things episodic just, 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 just to keep the show going. This isn't Batman, right. the animated series where we have to have Batman solve a crime each episode, fight a villain. And at the end of the episode, he might learn a lesson, but really it's going to go back to the status quo right. in the next episode. This is so different than that. And it is embracing DC legacy and understanding that it's about not just bringing in new characters, but it's about character evolution. Yeah. It is one of those rare characters in comic book history that has been allowed to evolve. I would say also to an extent, Peter Parker, Spider-Man, right? Similar to, to, to Robin, similar to Dick Grayson in that they're both sort of younger dudes. They were able to kind of go through their college years and, and some of the major losses that Peter Parker has suffered has kind of still stuck around. He lost Gwen Stacy and, and obviously Uncle Ben and his origin. But, they're, they're, you know, and, and, and at one point, Peter Parker has been married. But even that was retroactively taken away, right? It was a right. weird thing with, with one new day where the devil magically wished away his marriage to Mary Jane Watson. And that was, that was a little bit of a heartbreaking thing for me because, like I mentioned, I was born in 1987. And that was the year in comic books that Spider-Man had actually married Mary Jane Watson, Peter Parker, yeah, Mary Jane. I remember. Mary. So my entire existence, they had been married. And, and in 2006, when that went away, I went, well, okay, that's a, that's a real bummer that we weren't allowed to it's exciting to have these kinds of characters also grow up with the audience that they are interacting with. Yeah, for you know, sure. And in the sixties and seventies, Peter Parker was kind of groundbreaking in that he did that because they even asked the readers, they asked them, would you want to see Peter Parker stay in high school or would you want to see him go to college? And, and the majority said, let him go to college. Cause I'm also going to college. And I think Dick Grayson provided that same thing in the eighties when he was allowed to graduate from Robin to Nightwing and everything that was happening with his character in the new Teen Titans. And so to be able to lean into that full on in, in young justice and to not have those restrictions of, well, we have to keep them cyclical. We have to keep them episodic, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's, it provides story elements. It provides story opportunities that like you were mentioning, Rich, even in the comic books, if they want to have their cake and eat it too, there's still a little bit of, of kind of time budging that's happening. And it's, and it's weird when, when the new 52 happened in 2011 and Bruce Wayne was back in his Batman number one comic book, you open the comic book and Bruce Wayne has Dick Grayson, Tim Drake and Damian Wayne. And there are these, you know, they're like, they're, they're sort of preteen teenage and full grown men. And you're like, okay, you've had relationships with all of these kids as your son's in five years, that's kind of, that's kooky. That's crazy. Like, yeah. like, you know, did you meet yeah. Dick Grayson when he was 15 and he was Robin and now he's 20 and he's Nightwing? Like, you know, yeah. what, what does that mean exactly? So yeah. it's really cool that, that Young Justice gets to, gets to do that. And I think that there will never be a hard, hard reboot of these universes in the comic book worlds. Marvel will never do it. They're very attached to being able to say, hey, we started in 1961 and we're going strong. The closest they've come to it is with the big event that happened a few years ago called Secret Wars, where they kind of, again, sort of mashed up their universes together, played around with them a little bit, was able to bring in Miles Morales, who was a very popular character in his own pocket universe called the Ultimate Universe or 1610. So they absorbed him the same way that Crisis on Infinite Earths absorbed certain characters into one continuity. Um, but even then, like they're, they're still able to point at their, at their soap opera and go, we started in 1961 and that's awesome. Right now, DC can point to 2011, but even since then they've had certain comic book storylines that have revealed there's a multiverse 
Every comic book that has ever been published did happen. It's just kind of not in play right now. It's not that important. Right, right. And, and I think that there, there's a lot of pros that come with that too. And I think that that's great. But to go back to Young Justice, the thing that I love about it so much is that it's about character evolution and we get to see in real time these characters evolve. And one of the things about uh, Young Justice as well is the way that they're, they're, they, they are shifting a few things. Mm-hmm. So um, we just got Cyborg. Mm-hmm. So that means, uh, okay, so the, the new Teen Titans version, we now, have a, we now have a Beast Boy who's decided he's going back to the life. Mm-hmm. We now have a cyborg. We have not seen Starfire get introduced yet. She could mm-hmm. just show up at some point in this intergalactic conflict. We've True. not seen we've not seen Raven show up. We could get a version of the Titans that start seven or eight years past season one, which yeah. means that now into seasons four or five, we've got that generation that that team happening with. Dick maybe being a part of it, but he was never a part of that version of the team when he was Robin. He, to them, he's always been Nightwing, yeah. right? And yeah. if Starfire shows up and say she's not a teenager, say she does show up and she's you know Earth chronologically in her twenties, mm-hmm. she and Dick could have a thing going on. But Absolutely. I don't want to destroy all the Maneuver Seven uh, <laughs> shippers out there with Barbara. Listen, but all like, we're saying is there will be more ships to, to ship. That's all. <laughs> there's we're so saying. many ships to ship. There's so there's many ships so to many. ship out there. <laughs> um, but. But there's because they've offset the timeline of the introduction of some of these characters. I mean, hardware was is is a character that existed before Cyborg. Meaning, hardware could be a a mentor to Vic. How cool and interesting is that? So like cool. that's so interesting. If they if we can bring hardware back in, I know he was a, he was a league member, right? right. Um, but and we haven't seen him since that first episode. But still, like you know what I mean? Like there are yeah. ways that they can do this over time and and hand these off to other generations of kids. We have impulse, right? Yeah. W- what about characters like Excess, who's his oh cousin gosh. in the future from the Legion of Superheroes? Listen, what if even just introducing the Legion for that matter? Yes, you know that that the the Super Daycare episode. Is it oh, so. to like the, the potential of Young Justice? You know, it really, it really was them going. Yeah, we've got season nine planned, and here it is. Yeah. You know, here's yeah. nine. <laughs> right. and it's so cool, and it's so exciting, and um, and yeah, and and it, it, when you're talking about the different character dynamics and how they're they're sort of remixing the history, I love that. I love when it's done well, and you get a great surprise out of it. Sometimes things will get lost what, that you happen to love from the comic book worlds, right? I know that I loved in the Marvel side that Hank Pym was the creator of Ultron. And I thought that that gave a lot to that character of Hank Pym, good and bad. Like it was just very interesting. So when you get to the movies, it's Robert Downey Jr.'s Tony Stark, which I think is great and it works thematically. Um, But then you have Michael Douglas a few months later show up in Ant-Man and he's an older Hank Pym. And I'm kind of like, Oh, I'm missing the idea that, that first of all, Hank Pym could be, one of the founding members of the Avengers and I'm missing him interact with Tony Stark and I mean, they're, they're yeah. contemporaries normally. And I'm missing the idea that he uh, created or co-created Ultron. Yeah. But at the same time with Scott Lang being the, the modern day Ant-Man who he then mentors, I'm like very excited at the idea of Scott Lang interacting with the lineup that they have of those characters in those movies. Right. So, yeah. so it's like a give and take. It's like you're saying, like we could get, we could get a Teen Titans. They might be a little bit different, little different ages. And that's what, that's what the fun is of an adaptation, whether it's live action or animated, is when stuff like this lines up, it's so cool and it's exciting and it provides like a new version of a relationship that you might not have, you know, had known, had known about because yeah. it didn't happen in the comic books. And all of a sudden it's, you know, it's really cool. I was, uh, my, my best friend was in town um, last week and he hadn't seen season three yet. So of course- <laughs> I made him do that. Uh, no, he was, he loves the first two seasons. And so he was watching this and we got to, we got to another freak mm-hmm. and he, he had, I mean, he read comics with me when we were kids, we were, we were to, the same age and we were into that, but he's, hasn't been as immersed in it as I have. And he turned and looked at me and he's like, cyborg is made from a father box. Yeah. And I was really- like, I just looked at him and nodded and he goes, that's blowing my mind. How yep. amazing is that? Like, yep. I mean, I know that they incorporated some of that tech, the mother box technology into the movies right. and things like that. And I, and, and some of the modern reboots of him in the DC animated universe mm-hmm. have, have had this, you know, a mother box involved of some sort, but having it be 
just even that whole idea of tying it in, he just, of all the things that he saw that just blew his mind, so mm-hmm. much blew his mind, mm-hmm. that is one where he looked at me and he was like, I got chills. The implications of this are enormous. Yes. Oh my God, how does this make this Vic a whole new interesting character for me? Yes. You know, and while still keeping the heart of Vic alive, even when he was first created, the the downside of a lot of these characters like Tyrock in the Legion and yeah. Vic Stone in the in the seventies, the there was just this kind of real bad cliche stereotype of just yep. angry black guy. Yep. And if you go back and read Judas Contract, he's like, I was a football player and that's all I got. And I'm like an angry black guy because I can't play football. And I'm and he's evolved into just this beautiful character now where he's his own genius, mm-hmm. which is great. But you can still, even in, in Young Justice, you can see he's super smart. He's an athlete. He's pat, he has all this passion and he's got some anger. So mm-hmm. you can, you can incorporate a, a reason why he should be angry yes. without making him a trope, a bad Agreed. trope. Agreed. You know, Agreed. similar explorations have happened with Luke Cage is another great. Oh, comic. yep. Perfect. Yeah. African American character who had a lot of those cliches, but then the new versions of Luke are still using some of that, but they have these great reasons for it. And the other really exciting thing, too, about, about having this timestamp, I think, is that typically in comic book superhero universes, the idea is that um, the thing that's exciting is the crossover. But the idea is that each of these heroes, each of these characters are kind of an island who they get their powers on their own. They have their own origin story, right? Peter Parker got his powers differently than Bruce Banner, differently than Tony Stark, differently than Steve Rogers. Clark Kent has a different backstory than Bruce Wayne, has a different story than Diana, the mascara, so on and so forth. But the idea that this world continues to evolve in Young Justice and time goes on is starting to lead to certain characters are superheroes because they are growing up in the world of superheroes. Yes, they yes, they are powers. not in a vacuum. They're not in yeah. a vacuum. They get their powers directly because of other characters existing, other characters, you know, going on adventures, other characters making mistakes or other characters succeeding. Beast Boy in the Young Justice universe is Amazing. such a perfect example. Love that example. And I feel that that ties back to, I, to me, it's related that, that Beast Boy has the green skin because of Miss Martian, which I think is so brilliant. It was, it was also similar to a thing I really liked of the, of the sort of hit and miss X-Men movie franchise, but that the Beast Hank McCoy, as revealed in X-Men First Class, is blue because he sort of was experimenting with Mystique's, you know, uh, yeah. uh, DNA or whatever. I'm like, I like those little connections. So yeah. the, the idea that certain characters are now showing up, being inspired by, you know what I mean? Modeling themselves after the heroes that they are growing up, you know, uh, looking up to, I think mm-hmm. is, is brilliant. I think it's kind of meta. It sort of reflects how we... Uh, uh, take in superhero fiction across all media and how and how the world a lot of the times if you're obsessed with this stuff seems just dominated by the stuff and you can't escape it it's everywhere which right. to some is like oh please but for others it's like yes more this yeah. is awesome you know we also have Arrowette who was inspired yes. by her dad being saved we have Stephanie Brown who was one of the kids who got kidnapped by the Reach and rescued by Tim and Barbara like wow. you get we get so many of these of these little things in here making it feel like uh, Lucas Brown came on and we had a whole episode talking about how to create a rich living world mm-hmm. and these little choices help to make it feel like no there's a history here and I am dropped into this world where I can walk around around with mm-hmm. my imagination and see what's happening Absolutely. and and as uh, as amazing as the comics are and how much we love the comics mm-hmm. there's so much history there's almost too much to absorb for new readers and right. that is one of the reasons why i think young justice becomes such this beautiful on-ramp you know you can you can go i know a good story about dr fate Yep. So when I read a Dr. Fate comic, I have a general understanding of that there's a helmet and there's Naboo and there's other mm-hmm. people and Kent Nelson was a thing. I got enough that I can now go to the regular comic line mm-hmm. and read and understand those those characters. Totally. And I totally. think it's I think it's critical to have that for for DC in general, but even for Marvel too, with the Marvel yes. movies that brought so many people into them as well. So I, I really hope so. I will always love comics as much as um, cartoon shows and movies, and they're all different. They do different things, and I want comics to survive. You know, I want people to, I want the sales to go up and they're, they've been going down and it's, and it's, and it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's an industry that's, it's, it tries a bunch of stuff all the time and you can try things faster in a comic book because it's just a month later you can put it out than when you can with an animated show. But, but I love the polish that Young Justice has. I love that Young Justice is just a 
it's like a master class in like planning and execution. And I yeah. right, and I know that like movies are different, but I'm really, really excited because I got out of Aquaman in uh, December when the movie came out, and the first thing I thought was, how can we get it to a point where Black Manta has a son with an Atlantean? You know, that was my first thought of like, how how many more Aquaman movies will we have to get before we get Calder? before we get Calder? Yeah, <laughs> Calder. And, I, and 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 my brain went, well, see, to me, that's the solution. Is I'm really hoping that that the movie side can embrace the time jump more. I, I, I think oh, interesting. We've, we've moved past the point where uh, movie sequels have to pick up, you know, right after the last one left off. Uh, I think for certain cases it works, but other cases like if an Aquaman film, Aquaman 2 is released in, let's see, the first one came out in 2018. If the next one's released in 2021, three years later, I would love it if the movie opened and it's been a five year time jump, right? right? And Aquaman has a baby with Mera and he's been the king and you know, Black Manta has been planning his revenge for five years and like just go and have Aquaman come back from a, from the surface world and he says something like, Oh, Green Lantern's giving me a hard time because then the fans are like, Wait, what? There's a third yeah. the Justice League still around? Green Lantern? Which Green Lantern? Who's he talking about? Is it Hal? Is it John? Is it whatever? And then just plant those Is it Guy? Things. Is it Guy? <laughs> who's on- <laughs> Yeah, who's giving him a- it has to be Guy because he said he's giving him a hard time. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's that's uh, another thing that like time jumps and, and stuff afford is like it's it's kind of shortcut world building. It's it, you know, you can put that kind of stuff in a movie. And, and let the fans speculate what's happening in between each of these big films in the same way we did in between the seasons of Young Justice. And it's just rich and it adds to stuff. And, and the Marvel Cinematic Universe needs to do that as well. They kind of do it. They sort of do it. They, kind of, they obviously keep moving time forward. There's a couple of discrepancies and oddities here and there. But like for the most part, you know, the Avengers events happened in 2012 when that movie was released. And then Avengers Infinity War happened in... 2018 when that movie was released so they right. they are keeping things going which is exciting and cool and and i think helps them sort of keep just moving forward and keep that momentum and i'm really hoping that they will not do the thing where they recast certain characters who the actors might be getting too old to be in an action movie i don't want right. to see a new actor play iron man just so that we can get a new iron man movie i want to see ruby williams I want to see. Yes, yes, definitely. Right? Ironheart, right? absolutely. That's the idea. And, and like you were saying, Marvel might not have legacy as much. They have a couple of characters that I like to kind of call replacement heroes. You yeah. know, uh, for in the comic books for a while, uh, Jim Rhodes was Iron Man, but then he sort of became War Machine, and that's his own thing. Yeah. And Thor was Jane Foster for a little while, but now she's not anymore, and it's back to regular male Thor. And there's been other characters that have taken up the mantle. Bucky was Captain America, but now it's back to being Steve, and we're going to keep going. But I think that it would be daring and cool and similar to Young Justice if that movie franchise went, yes, there's going to be a new Captain America movie, but it's going to be the Falcon. It's going to be Sam Wilson. Or yes, there's going to be a new Thor, but but hey, we got Natalie Portman to come back. We, we pitched her on it. We convinced her and she's going to play Jane Foster who takes up the hammer and she's going to be Thor. Because I think that that's, that's unique and that's where a lot of these superhero universes are going. And with Marvel specifically, uh, the best example, I think, has been Miles Morales, who even though there hasn't been a legacy Spider-Man thing, Miles is the closest we've gotten. And I believe that he's won over worldwide audiences at this point, that if there were ever to be a full on permanent passing of the torch from Peter to Miles, that a lot of people would embrace it. And I yeah. think a lot of the times these companies are scared of having that happen with some characters. I know that for me growing up, Wally West was my Flash and to have Barry Allen come back from the dead, it was really cool, really exciting, but I'll always feel a little bit bummed that it's not Wally and Kyle Rayner as Green Lantern like they were when I was a kid growing up. Because And, the, the and for me, it was Hal and Barry. Hal and, and Barry. And, and Barry was the hero who died. I, I read that and it, it, it blew my mind and I was waiting for him to come back and for decades he never did. And yeah. I had a hard time accepting Wally. Right. <laughs> un- until Mark yeah. Wade's Mark Wade Zero Hour where... He talked about just how how unique Wally is and that he loves being a hero. I talk all about that in our Secret Origins yeah. Wally West Flash totally. episode. But but so every every generation's got their people. So mm-hmm. we but there has to be a way to move things forward to bring new people in. Who like Miles Morales will be Spider Man for a huge generation. Absolutely. And I I've read Peter for forty seven years. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm okay. My, Miles is. I am just fine. 
yeah, with Miles exactly. coming on the scene. Exactly. I love it. Because love if, it. Any, if anything, it just it, it 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 makes it so that Peter will be that much more immortal. It makes it so that Barry Allen will be that much more. More people will know about Barry if if people grew up with a different Flash because it always sort of comes back to that mentor that 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 you know that yeah. the first superhero that it showed up. Even with loving Jaime Reyes and uh, and Blue Beetle, it just makes me love Ted more because yeah. I read that comic, uh, you know, Countdown yeah. to, to to Infinite Crisis, where he dies and Ted, and that broke my heart. Yeah. And even though I felt like he wasn't going to come back, and I was excited about Jaime, it makes that that impact and that sacrifice like very meaningful and it's very, you know, and it's, and it's impactful and young justice will eventually someday. end, as much as we hate to admit it, there will be a finite number of seasons to that show. But, but then when I think about the generation of people that are growing up with this show and what they will contribute yes, know, years down the line and, and hopefully give back to those same characters, like what influence will young justice have on DC comics 20 years from now, 20 years from now, like we're already seeing a lot of that stuff. I mean, the, 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 the title itself, young justice came back as a comic, I'm sure because of the impact of this show and the influence of this show. But like 20 years from now, what are the comics going to look like? What are the movies going to look like? What are the live action TV shows going to look? It's already been a huge jump from when we were kids to now, like as all the super geeks when we were younger are now in the industry doing the work and, and taking those emotional memories and putting them up on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Anyway, Okay, we've got to wrap up. We had a yeah. we had a super long chat, and I I'm so excited. And I I suspect you and I will be chatting more in the future. So Great. thanks so much for spending time with us here in the Watchtower, Hector. Where can people find you out on Earth Prime? You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Hector is Funny, and uh, check out the 500 Greatest Films podcast if you like podcasts. It's me and my buddy Kellen Knobloch. He's my roommate and my good buddy. We are taking 10 years to watch 500 movies. We're watching a movie a week. <laughs> And we're, we're, we're like a year, a year and a couple months into it. Uh, and it's been real fun. And so we're uh, it's, uh, you know, each week we watch sometimes a great movie, sometimes a bad movie. Um, we're going off this specific list and we watch a movie with a guest and it's a blast. So check that out if you like podcasts and, uh, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Thanks to everyone else too, for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ files on Facebook at crashing the mode on Tumblr at theyjfiles.tumblr.com and on our website, crashingthemode.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. If that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating or review, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.